If you've ever been climbing, it's a really sobering thought to think that the only thing separating you from death is a six-inch piece of aluminum called a carabiner. High-altitude climber and a U.S. world uh, renowned climber Ed Weisters um, has climbed Everest six times. He's climbed 14 of the highest peaks in the world, over 8,000 meters, and he's done it without oxygen. You know, he is just a rare breed. Um, he's also a motivational speaker. I guess when you climb Everest six times, you have the ability to motivate people to get out there and to do something great. And he actually, uh, when he's a motivational speaker for, for uh, teams like uh, the Seattle Seahawks and the Vancouver Canucks, I mean, he's taught in the, he's spoken in the NHL and the NFL. And when he does, he brings with him a carabiner for everybody on the team. He wants them to understand that the, the multifaceted function of this incredible tool and all the things that it does. And it takes on a completely new perspective when you think about team climbing. So when you team climb, you actually take on the responsibility of everybody else that's hooked on to the rope. If you fall, potentially your team falls with you. Um, and it's kind of a sobering thought again to think that the team lives and dies by each other and the dependency that they put on one another. You know, I don't have necessarily a fear of heights. I, I more have a fear of death. Um, I, it's, a, it's amazing what you can do when you have the security to do it. One time I was actually going to be going up, onto the eve, uh, up to my house and, and clearing out a bunch of leaves that, that were in the eaves and um, I got up there on the ladder and I climbed up and all of a sudden as I got onto the roof, I froze. I mean, the pitch of the roof was so steep that I literally froze in place. I couldn't move. I couldn't even reach into my hand to get my phone to call Kaylee and to get help. Um, so I literally sat there for, uh, it had to be been 20 minutes trying to figure out how I'm going to get down. And eventually I just slowly worked my way down to the ladder and got down. And it, it, it was this incredible sobering experience to think um, how fearful you can be. But again, it, it's, it goes back to what you can accomplish when you feel the security to do so. This particular carabiner that I'm using right now, which is supporting my whole entire weight, except for the, the weight that's on the rope, is actually rated for 25 kilonewtons. Now, in the climbing world, kilonewtons are important because that's the load, the capacity, which means that this particular carabiner can carry a little over 5,600 pounds. Right now, with my weight put on the, the weight of this carabiner and everything else, it actually is only using up about three and a quarter percent of my total body weight. The other day, Parker and I were watching uh, Running Wild with Bear Grylls, and he takes uh, different celebrities out, and he puts them in different situations. And the particular celebrity that was with him this one time was Joel McHale. Um, he's a, a star from the show The Community. And Joel uh, and Bear were out in a slot canyon in Arizona. Now, when they first went into the slot canyon, they were doing a little bit of boulder climbing, and it wasn't really anything major. It was kind of like a nice walk. But then as they get further into the canyon, they started to encounter more technical aspects of the, of the canyon. They had tight passages they had to squeeze through. Um, the, the terrain started to get rockier. And eventually when they got to the end of the slot canyon, the only way out of the canyon was up. Well, Joel McHale was not necessarily the most experienced climber, and he didn't necessarily want <clears throat> to climb to begin with. And so Bear had to assure him of his equipment. He said, Joel, we have a rope that's rated to carry your weight, my weight, and probably three other people's weight. We have a carabiner that's rated to carry all of your weight. And then he did this really interesting. He tapped on the mountain and he said, Joel, this mountain isn't going anywhere. He taught Joel how to climb out of that canyon. When he got to the top, he was elated at what he experienced because he was able to conquer the mountain. Sometimes life is like a slot canyon. Sometimes there's times where you just happily walk in and things are going well. And yeah, there's some things you have to navigate, but it's not that big a deal. 
Other times you have to squeeze through these narrow places and it feels like the canyon walls are, are caving in on you and you have to figure out how you're going to get through these narrow passages. And then the other times in life, like many times, the only way out is up. <laughs> well, I think that's why I want to share with you today the necessity to add a carabiner to your spiritual toolkit. Welcome to Base Camp. Well, if you were with us last week, you know that we started a new two-part message on uh, climbing. And last week we talked about the rope. And in fact, there's a couple of things I just want to share with you to catch you up if you weren't able to join us regarding the rope. A key thing that we discussed was that ropes are useless unless they're attached to something. They're useless. Ropes in themselves have no strength, power, ability to help or save anybody unless they're actually attached to something to give them that strength. And that what your rope is attached to is critical. What it's attached to is critical. We also discussed the fact that, the, the, in the, for the analogy's sake, rope is the church. And if the rope is the church, then God is the mountain. And this is going to become even more important today as we discuss moving forward in our series and adding to our spiritual toolbox. We also gave incredible scriptural support to show that God is the mountain, that he is the rock and he is our redeemer. In fact, Psalm 18 is a great psalm. If you have the opportunity, I would encourage you to go back and read Psalm 18 and to, to read all the descriptive words that are used to describe as, as God is the rock and the fortress and the stronghold. I want to share another passage of Scripture with you that I think is a little bit more personal, that it gives a little bit more of a personal touch. It's actually found in 2 Samuel chapter 22, and it's a song that David sings to the Lord after he's rescued from the hand of Saul and after he's in a cave and he's, he's uh, scared, he ran. This is the song that he sings to the Lord. In 2 Samuel 22 verses 2 through 4, it says, the Lord is my rock. Now I'm going to stop for a second. I want you to pay attention to the descriptive words and the word picture that David is painting for us as we go deeper into this scripture. He says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me. And my place of safety, he is my refuge, my savior, the one who saves me from violence. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saved me from my enemies. I mean, think about the words that David uses. Rock, fortress, savior, power, safety, refuge. I mean, these are all incredible descriptive words to describe how God is there for us and he's the rock of our salvation. Now, why could David sing this song with such great assurity? It really goes back to the fact that he saw and experienced how God showed up. He, he knew that God was his redeemer because he had experienced his redemption. He knew that God was his savior because he had experienced his forgiveness. He knew that he was his fortress because he was in the midst of this run for his life and, and he was taken care of and he was safe. David put his full weight and the full weight of his trust on God, and God came through. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it was easy for David, because it wasn't. I think David's a great example for us to see how difficult it can be and how, how we can even mess up so many times, but yet we can still put our full trust and our full weight on God, and he shows up. Maybe not in the way that we always anticipate, but he shows up for us. Now, just as a carabiner has multiple functions, I, I want to help us discover why a carabiner, why this piece of aluminum is so important to, our, to add to our spiritual toolkit. So I'm going to give you three points. Here's point number one. Point number one is a carabiner reminds us of the dependability of God. The dependability of God. Now, I want you to turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 3. And now I'm going to give you a few seconds like I do each week to go run. And hopefully you have your Bible with you. Um, you might actually struggle a little bit to find Habakkuk. It's only three chapters. 
and it's in the minor prophets. So if you open up God's word and you see Psalm and you go to the right, you hit Proverbs and all of a sudden you can keep going to the right, you'll hit the major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah. And then you start hitting these obscure named books like Obadiah and Nahum and Zephaniah. Uh, these are the minor prophets. And, and Habakkuk is right there in between Nahum and Obadiah. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Nahum and, and Zephaniah um, is right where you'll find Habakkuk. So I'll give you a few seconds to find it. We're going to be looking at Habakkuk chapter 3. While you're going there, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context. I think it's important. This is what we're going to read is, is kind of like a journal. It's looking at Habakkuk's journal and, and what his relationship with God was like. Now, this I think is really going to be important because it fits well into today's context. <laughs> what we're experiencing right, right now was really strange. It was nothing like we'd ever experienced before. And, and trying to make sense of God in the midst of all of that. Well, Habakkuk was in a very similar place. He struggled to understand what God was doing. He struggled to understand why isn't God stepping in? I mean, there was lots of different questions that Habakkuk had for God, and they kept going back and forth and having this dialogue with one another. Now you have to know, prophets like Habakkuk, they didn't show up when things were going well. Prophets showed up when people were in trouble, when Israel was in trouble, when there was a message to be sent by God. That's when you heard from a prophet. And it was never a prophet come and saying, hey, you guys are doing a great job and guess what? It's going to keep getting better. A lot of times when the prophet showed up, it meant something was wrong and it potentially could get worse. And so again, I think that the context for us today is so important. But Habakkuk's journal shows that even in times of crisis, because we're going to see the crisis, we're going to see the complexity of what Habakkuk was dealing with and the confusion. But even in the midst of that, what Habakkuk shows us and what, what God reveals to Habakkuk is that even in the midst of all of that, even in the midst of the crisis and the chaos and the confusion, God expects and anticipates that his people will be faithful and that they'll trust him. So again, I think this really has some great pieces for us to study today. So Habakkuk chapter 3, let's start with verse 2. It says, I have heard about you, Lord. Now, I think this is interesting that Habakkuk says to God, I've heard all about you. He, not necessarily has he experienced the presence of God quite yet, but he's telling God, I've heard the stories. I've heard what you've shared. He says, I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, now listen to this, help us again as you did in years gone by. Now, I don't know about you, but as I read the book of Habakkuk and I read his journal, and I think about in our context today, this is something that I need today. Help us again as you did in years gone by. Would you do it again, Lord? Would you do it again and help us? Habakkuk begins to remember the dependability of God and that God is dependable. In fact, he even talks about um, Habakkuk in, in chapter 3, verses 3 through 15, he really shares all of the information that he remembers and the stories that were passed down from generation to generation to explain how God had rescued the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. He, he, he refers to the plagues and how God had, had saved the Israelites from the plagues and how the Red Sea was this formidable challenge in front of them, but God had parted the Red Sea. And he goes further and he talks about the time in the wilderness. So Habakkuk is, is recalling and remembering how God was dependable then, which is going to make a difference to God's dependability now. And I think it's imperative during this season to reflect on the dependability of God. I pray that you've experienced God's faithfulness in your story. I pray that you've experienced his faithfulness, his faithfulness in your past. Because God desires to, for you to trust him in your present. And again, this is key. It's like each time you use a carabiner, your confidence grows that it's able to hold you. Now, I want you to stick that in your mind for just a few minutes as we continue down this journey. The more you use something and the more that it comes through, the more confidence you have to keep using it. So let me sum up point one about the dependability of God by saying this. If you don't reflect on what God did in the past, you won't experience him in the present and you cannot trust him in the future. 
let that sink in for a second. If you don't reflect on what God did in the past, you won't experience him in the present because, because you, you, you're not reflecting on his past experiences and what he did for us in the past. And that means that we cannot trust him in the future. I think this is really critical for us. Israel knew this, and that's why they kept reminding them, the, those around them, hey, remember what God did, because we believe he can do it again. Now, point number two, a carabiner reminds us that you can trust God. You can trust God. John 14, 1 says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Now, what's critical about this passage of Scripture is that the the me in this passage is Jesus. And Jesus is telling his disciples right before he's about to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and be turned over to the religious leaders, he's telling them in this moment, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. He helps the disciples to see that if you put your trust in me, then you're putting your trust in God. He's not just making a theological statement. He's actually making a statement about his deity, about who he is. And he tells them very clearly that that things are going to get weird, (laughs) that he's going to suffer, he's going to die. He says, but even when things get weird, trust me, trust me. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Now, I debated on using the analogy of of trust versus faith. You know, uh, point two could be a carabiner reminds us uh, that uh, we can put our faith in God. This kind of debate about faith versus trust. And I did a little bit more digging into finding out what is the difference between the two. Well, faith is actually a noun. It's, as it says in Hebrews chapter 11, it's evidence. It's, It's a substance. It's having confidence. It's a noun. It's actually something that, that is, Uh, tangible that you can experience. Um, uh, The first segment that we had earlier was um, Joseph and I were joking about the fact that it was a leap of faith uh, to trust the equipment, to trust the rope, to trust that I wasn't going to fall from the ceiling. But here we look at um, uh, that was putting my faith into trust. Now let me explain that. Trust is a verb. It's something that you do. So I have faith that the carabiner will hold me, but I show my trust by using it. So you can look at an object, a noun, and say that that I have faith in that object, but I don't trust that object until I actually use it. So that's the difference between faith and trust here. Now, I want to suggest the possibility that as we discussed that God is the mountain and that the church is the rope, I want to suggest that Jesus is the carabiner. He's the link between us and God. Now, again, I'm using this for analogy's sake, so go with me here. John 14, 6, this is a little bit later in the same chapter. Jesus is again talking to his disciples and he tells them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's helping them to realize that if you want access to God the mountain, then you have to to first trust Jesus the carabiner. You have to first see the link between Jesus and God. He says, he says, and even God multiple times throughout scripture says and tells us that Jesus is the way to him. Nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. That's why our relationship with Jesus is so important. And you, just as we talk about trusting God and the dependability of God, we can also trust Jesus and the dependability of Jesus because Jesus, as he even declared, and as we see throughout Scripture, is God. So keep moving with me. I like uh, the word image that's created in Hebrews 10, verse 23, when it says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. Hold tightly without wavering. But what are we holding tightly to? The hope that we affirm. You see, there's always hope when it comes to God. Whenever we're experiencing Uh, with, With God, there's always a reason to hope. 
This is important. Habakkuk had to exercise his trust, not just his faith. He had to exercise his trust during a really difficult season of life. In fact, let's go and look at Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now, this is really telling. Habakkuk says, Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, and there's no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the field and the cattle barns are empty. Now here comes the trust. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Now I, I, I read that and I have to let that sink in because everything for Habakkuk is gone. There's no olives, no grapes. There's no, no cattle. There's no, there's, it's all gone. The flocks, they're, they're all dead. The fields are not ripe in a harvest. They're actually all gone and it's desolate. And even in the midst of all of that, Habakkuk says, but yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. In the midst of the chaos, Habakkuk chose to rejoice in the Lord. Now, I want to challenge you this morning to think about this. Even in the midst of this chaos, have you had the opportunity? Have you chosen to rejoice in the Lord? Even in the midst of feeling isolated and alone and quarantined and cut off and all the things that we're experiencing, the fear of of being infected, the fear of a family member being infected, or going through the pain and the loss of somebody experiencing death or being infected themselves. I, I know this is never easy. It wasn't easy for David. It's not easy for, for Habakkuk. But yet there is a choice. You have to choose joy. Point number three, and this is where we're going to end. A carabiner reminds us of the strength of God. The strength of God. The strength of God, the ability to hold you in the middle of the difficulty. Right in the midst of the difficulty, God can hold you. So contrary to popular belief, carabiners do more than hold your coffee cup to your backpack, you know, or um, hold your keys. Because uh, a lot of times we use carabiners as almost accessories but there's something interesting between the accessory and the actual equipment. In fact, check this out. It shows you when you purchase a carabiner, if it's meant for climbing. And if it's not, it says not for climbing right there, right on the ring. Now, I would pity the person that would put their trust in a piece of aluminum that they buy at Walmart that says not for climbing, and yet they're going to go out and they're going to climb with it. That's probably not going to end well. But this is really interesting. This warning not for climbing is, it means not as strong. Uh, that's what this warning is. Not for climbing because it's not as strong. Now, if Jesus is the carabiner, I wonder if we have put our trust into counterfeit Jesuses that are not for climbing. I wonder if we put our trust in something else other than Jesus and we expect it to hold us and to keep us safe when we're climbing these, the, the, the experiences of life. And, but the, the reality is, it, all of those things should come with a warning that it's not for climbing because it's not as strong. There's only one Jesus, and he is the one who holds us and has the strength to hold us and give us the strength that we need in order to uh, navigate through this life. It, it's, it's amazing to me to think about the, the counterfeit Jesuses that we rely on to hold us, and they simply can't. Habakkuk 3 verse 19 says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Um, back a few years ago, my family and I had the chance to go to Alaska, and we went to Denali National uh, Park. And it was a phenomenal experience. But while we were there, we would look up into these huge mountains and we would see these tiny little white specks. And I remember as we were in Denali, uh, the, the guide shared with us that those little white specks were actually doll sheep. And doll sheep are really interesting characters. They're, they're actually, the males are, are quite large. They're, they're huge. 
And uh, when you look and see them, they are literally leaping over um, the mountainside. And in fact, what was really interesting is you see the, the little ones within minutes after being born, they actually are jumping and leaping around and they're getting their, their you know, for lack of better phrasing, their feet under them. So these doll sheep are really, really interesting. And we had to go to REI, or we didn't necessarily, we didn't go to REI, but we went to uh, a store like that in order to find hiking shoes. And we had to buy hiking shoes to go to Alaska. Well, you know, these doll sheep, they're not going to REI to, to buy hiking boots or hiking shoes. They, they, when they were born, they were born with it as a part of their equipment of life. And what Habakkuk is saying here is, with the help of God and the strength of God, you can do this. You can get through this. And he will give us the strength to do it. So here, here's something interesting. The Lord is my strength. That's what the scripture says in verse 19. The Lord is my strength. The only way that we can experience the, the strength to get through this is from the Lord. And then what does it say in verse 19? It says, he makes me sure-footed. Meaning, He's the one that, that assures us of where to step. Uh, I think about, you know, uh, guides. And when we were in Alaska, they had these huge poles and we thought that they were light poles and they weren't. They're actually poles to help trucks navigate um, going down the road. And they're, they're massive. I mean, they're over like 30 feet tall and it's to help keep them guided. It's, it's, it shows them where the edge of the, the road is so they don't go off the road because the snow piles up so high. I, I picture Jesus you know, being like that for us, where, you know, as you trudge through this deep snow, you don't know what's underneath you. You can't see it because it's so deep. And he has this pole and he's, he's putting it down and he's looking at us and he's saying, okay, step here. Don't step anywhere else except for where I tell you to step because I know what's here and I know that it can hold your weight. And that's the, that's the cool thing about this passage with Habakkuk. It's helping us to see that he makes our feet as sure-footed as the deer and that we can tread on the heights, but it's not going to be because of your ability. It's going to be because of God's ability. It's, it, it's not about your ability. It's about his strength. He says that his strength, sovereign Lord, my strength comes from you. I don't look at a carabiner and say, you know, hold on, hold on, right? I don't, I don't have to do that because I trust and believe that it will do what it was intended to do. So as we close, I'm going to ask you this critical question this morning. What are you attached to through all of this? What are you linking on to and saying, I'm going to hold on to this because I believe it's going to help me get through all of this? And I think right now, if you were to be honest, there's lots of things that we're holding on to, but are we holding on to God the mountain? Are we clipping on with the, the carabiner of uh, uh, Jesus to bring us to the Father and to give us the stability to hold on? I... I when you uh, realize this, when you attach to the mountain, you transfer your weight and your power to the weight and the power of the mountain. And just like Bear Grylls looked at Joel McHale and he tapped the mountain and he told Joel, this mountain isn't going anywhere. I want to say the same thing to you this morning. This mountain isn't going anywhere. And if you want to make it through this, it's not going to be because of your ability. It's going to be because of God's strength. He wants to strengthen you. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to, to know that you can have, his feet as, you can have uh, your feet be as sure-footed as a deer and tread on the heights because he can do that for you this morning. So as we go through this toolkit uh, uh, of our faith, we started out with fire, which reminds us of the presence of God. And we went to fishing. We talked about that God fished for us and now we need to fish for people. And then last week we, uh, we talked about the rope and which reminds us of the rescue. It's the rescue that God did for us and it's also the rescue that we need to do for others because rescued people rescue people. And then today, the carabiner, it's going to be a reminder for us in our spiritual toolbox to trust God. 
Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this incredible lesson, Lord. The, just the way that you have woven Habakkuk's story with our story and the way that we've seen even in the desolation that, that Habakkuk was experiencing and the choice that he made to rejoice. Lord, I pray that we too would lean on the promises of Scripture that, that talk about, I will see your goodness in the land of the living. Lord, just like Elijah looked out and saw bones, Lord, and, and questioned, can these bones live? Lord, it was your breath that breathed into them to, to become um, alive again. And so, Lord, I pray that your breath would breathe into us and give us life. Lord, I thank you for the incredible assurity and the dependability that you bring um, to us today. And that, Lord, nobody comes to the Father Nobody comes to you except through your son, Jesus. So Lord, I pray that we would put our faith and our trust in Jesus today and begin that journey of recognizing that the mountain isn't going anywhere. So again, Lord, I praise your name and thank you for this time. Amen.